Christ, he's looking at me. <laughs> he picked me up by the scuff of the neck and kind of pinned me against the wall. And I'm just going, you lazy wee English. You're going to do more than a day. <laughs> We're going to give all, all our bonuses away. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, he's on 100 grand a week. I'm on five grand a week. <laughs> you can give your f bonuses away, but I'm, what? I, I want to keep my <laughs> bonuses. Hello and welcome to the Rest is Football uh, Q&A episode uh, with me, Gary Lineker, uh, Alan Shearer and Micah Richards. Um, let's start with a question from DMC McNamara. Uh, how did you decide on the three of you for the podcast? Uh, brilliant dynamic. Uh, Micah and Alan uh, laughing is uplifting. Uh, love it. Um, right. Um, I suppose we really hatched the idea during uh, the Qatar World mm. Cup, um, we had a lot of time on our hands and spent a lot of time together. And also, of course, we'd, we've worked together um, both in terms of a podcast and match of the day many times. And we thought it might be a good idea. In Actually, the truth is I, I just persuaded <laughs> the two of you. No, let's go back though, Gary. Let's go real mm. back because real back you lot started a podcast it was sort mm. of during covid wasn't it it was the three big hitters it was you two and righty that's that's how it started and basically you're a substitute i was a it was just like my career wasn't it <laughs> just like my career and i had big shoes to fill with righty didn't i come on let's be honest because everybody loves righty and i remember from the first couple of ones, where's Righty? Oh, I'm sick to death of Mikey. Why, why is Righty not here? And as as it went on a little bit, people started <laughs> getting used to me a little bit. And that's when I thought, actually, okay, people are starting to respect me a little bit. And then that's when you said, Gary, I think we should do our own. And of course, an, unlike your football career, <laughs> Micah, you, you, you've not really, you've not so much burst onto the scene, but kind of eased your way in. Just ease my way. But that's the thing. I don't, I didn't, I don't want to burst. I didn't want to burst onto the scene. I've done that in the past and it's gone the other way quite as quick in terms of, you know, didn't play as much games as I wanted, always injured. So let's just hope now with the broadcasting career, it can be slow. And surely... And grow. And yes, exactly. Please. Slow and grow. No, actually, we, we, we spent a lot of time talking about it in, in Qatar to do um, a podcast along these lines because obviously I'm in the podcast business with, with, with Goal Hanger. Um, it's my company along with Jack and Tony. And we wanted to do a football podcast. It seemed mad that we had so many big podcasts. The rest is history. The rest is politics, empire and... Um, and we thought, why is there not a monster football podcast out there? And perhaps we could make it um, one. And so there are a lot of very good football podcasts, obviously, but they're all, lots of them are journalistically led um, and they're a little bit earnest. And I wanted to get one where we'd have, we'd discuss football, serious issues, but also have some some fun and recount some of our tales from, from our careers and our experiences. And um, and hence, um, <laughs> hence we started and we wanted to start at the um, beginning of a season. And here we are. And we get on well, lads. We like taking the p*** out of each other and we don't mind hammering each other, do we? It's quite good fun, isn't it? Not at all. And to be honest, Alan, you deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. But not to... Um... Just lastly, before we move on, I think having the different ages as well for the dynamic helps because if I've got the, the modern stories, I know this is not... <laughs> Where are you going with this, Mike? I can see the way you're looking at me. <laughs> the older, because when you, every time you mention a story, both of you, about Gaza, people are instantly tuned in because everyone's got their heroes. So, and then I've played with like some modern day and everyone looks, loves Jack Grealish now, don't they? And I've got stories about Grealish and Balotelli. So I think all these things together really work. Speaking of the ages, are you all right, guys? You're taking your meds this morning? Are you, you, you got out of bed all right? And, yeah. Don't worry about me, Alan. <laughs> I'm out of my bed, I'm fo I've walked the dog, uh, I've done many things, even though it's uh, relatively early on a Tuesday morning. 
Um, I've got a question from Lindsay Ramskill. If you could lift any other sporting trophy, what would it be? That's a good Ooh. question. But are we talking outside of football, Gaz, or are we talking just yes. like... Yes, I think that's clearly the question, is outside of football. It would have to, it would have to be Augusta, wouldn't it? The Masters, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, just that green that green jacket. Yeah, I suppose it can. Does that count as a trophy? You do get one, don't you, though? You get that, like, copy of the clubhouse, isn't it? The... Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's, yeah, amazing. That would be for me. Yeah, that would be incredible. Micah? Rubbish. We've got to go Super Bowl, haven't we? Imagine the Super Bowl. I can see you in a Super Bowl. Bowling in, half-time show and everything. I, that's a bit of me, that America, isn't it? In, <laughs> in England, you know, we might have... What do we have at half-time? We have scores. We have people running on the pit the mascot. But in America, we've got proper yeah. entertainment. We get sliced oranges at half-time, though. <laughs> 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 So I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to say Super Bowl. All right. Well, I was I was thinking about the Masters, but I'm going to go for something else. I'm going to say, and probably the smallest trophy in sport. The urn, is it? Ashes. The urn, the ashes, the ashes urn, beating Australia, yeah. scoring a double century. Oh, that would be, that, that would be uh, very special uh, indeed. Um, Paul Blankley asks, Gary, I seem to recall an incident at Philbo, which I presume he means Filbert Street. Um, so I name my dog after uh, <laughs> where Jock uh, which is Jock Wallace had you up against the wall at half time can you confirm and by the lungs and for Alan and Micah any similar manager incidents for you both loving this series by the way thank you very much Paul um, it was indeed true um, I was playing in the reserves at Leicester. Jock Wallace had just been appointed manager uh, of Leicester City and it was a midweek game at Filbert Street, a night match, um, playing for the reserves and came in at half-time, went and sat in my spot in the dressing room and Jock Wallace, who, for those of you who don't know, was the former Rangers manager. Um, he was a Scottish goalkeeper um, he was a huge character, big personality, uh, love him to bits. And he was about you know, six foot four, wide as a door. And the first time I ever saw him was in this half time and he walks in the dressing room and he's he looks incandescent with rage and he's where he's got you we English, you lazy <laughs> and and I thought, Christ, he's looking at me. And he walks in, and I, I tell no lies, things were different back then. He picked me up by the scuff of the neck and kind of pinned me against the wall. And I'm just going, you lazy wee English. You've got to do more than that. And I was going, oh, my God. I wouldn't have minded, but we were 2-0 up and I'd scored both goals. Um, <laughs> so... Um, in the second half, I went out and I was useless, right? I was a gibbering wreck. I thought, oh my God, this is like a nightmare. Coming at the end of the game, he comes in the dressing room and he, he goes, we man, in my office, nine o'clock in the morning. So I went, okay, okay. Um, so I go home and I think my career's over. I was 17 at the time. I thought, it's curtains. So I just... So I, I get there. I get there early. Um, I, I back court to nine. I was sat outside his office like the naughty boy waiting to see the headmaster and eventually he come come in laddie sit down so i sat down opposite him i forgive the accents i love it keep <laughs> going we're impressed uh, so he said sit down and i went and i sat down and I'm, I'm shaking thinking my career's about to be ended and he went i want to say one thing laddie he said you were magnificent last night. And I went, I beg your pardon. He said, I he said, I just wanted to make sure I keep your feet on the ground. You've got a wee chance. And I walked, and I, and I thought, God, he could have told me that last night. Um, I never slept a wing. What a brilliant story that is. <laughs> and a brilliant accent as well. Mr. Uh, I'm not sure. It was, he, he, was, he barked it far louder than I uh, did. Um, from Ollie Davis. With the rumours around that some USA players aren't happy about not being paid to play in the Ryder Cup, what happens with footballers' international fees? Oh. Well, I don't know about in, in your eras, but certainly in mine, um, not that, that there wasn't much of a salary, but we always 
gave it away to charity. No one took any money from playing for England. I, I, um, I think there's probably more of a bonus set up now if they do particularly well. But I, I'm not sure it's changed. I mean, I, I'm aware that we give uh, a lot of it, most of it, away um, when we played for England. But I couldn't even, I couldn't even tell you whether we got paid and how much <laughs> it was. I didn't know. It was, it was one of those things that was pretty irrelevant. I think so. I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have a clue. Um, mm. I think we got we certainly got bonuses in World Cups and European Championships, but again, a lot of it was given away to charity. I think we got one. Well, no, we no, we did get paid. We definitely did get paid. Um, and I think the company was called 1966. So, say if you go away for a, a double header like a ten day, I think you got paid like ten or fifteen grand. Um, and then we used to get bonuses that used to go straight to charity like um alan said but i remember there was one time earlier on within the squad and don't forget england back then it was a golden generation so you had jt 100 grand a week rio 100 grand a week ashley cole 100 grand a week i get into the team and i'm only micah richards 150 grand a week <laughs> no, no but i'm on eight i'm i'm 18 at the time. In the England squad at 18. At 18. <laughs> so I've not signed my my big deal yet. So I think I'm on like five grand a week. I think that's what I'm on at the time. So I remember JT, John Terry that is, sits us down in, in a, we had a little meeting before one of the games and he goes, lads, um, we know the money doesn't mean that much to you when you come away. So what we're going to do, we're going to give all, all our bonuses away. So I'm thinking to myself, he's on 100 grand a week. I'm on five grand a week. You can give your bonuses away. I, I, I want to keep my bonuses. And I just remember like we had to sign some waiver to say it was good. But I, ne I never forgave him after that. I wanna, when I mentioned it, because a couple years later, I mentioned that he came to Villa, and I was like, JT absolutely killed me, man. He said, I know, but it was the right thing to do. So fair play to him. Fair play to him. But I, yeah, I was good. Question from Keith O'Dub. Uh, what has Alan Shearer done with his winnings from the Silleth Golf Club uh, a few weeks back? And does he feel guilty still playing off seven? <laughs> <laughs> he don't play off seven. Six point nine, Gary. I'm actually, I might have been cut because I played. Uh, I played yesterday, so I might have been cut because I got thirty six points in a big competition at my local club yesterday. So I would have been cut. So, uh, did you win it? No, nah, I came in. I was leading in the clubhouse, and thirty six. I had, I think thirty nine win won it in the end. But um, I'll still get cut for that. Do I feel guilty taking the winnings? Do I? <laughs> <laughs> I bought a new sleeve of balls because I probably lost three or four that day as well from Ben hi guys barring injuries how good do you think Brazilian Ronaldo could have been let's put it this way he was one yeah. of the absolute greats even with his injuries and at one point during his career which was between the 1998 World Cup and the 2002 World Cup he was out for three and a half years with the most horrendous knee injury. He came yeah. back, um, played just before the World Cup, got back into the Brazilian team and then won the Golden Boot, won the World Cup, scored two in the final and eight in the whole competition. So I think we can safely say without injuries, um, he would have been even better, which seems um, hard to believe because he would have obviously had way more success. Yeah, I think he would have been... Equal, if not better, than Messi and Ronaldo. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Such was uh, such was his ability. But you're right; he was ravished, ravished by uh, by injuries, unfortunately. But yeah, what a player! Unbelievable, great, great player. He would have been the goat, the greatest of yeah. all time, without doubt. He was ridiculous. He had everything: touch, yeah. speed, technique intelligence, timing of the run, finishing. Yeah, without doubt, it would have been the goal. Here's a question for you, both at their prime. Who's the best Ronaldo? R9. R9. Sorry, I think Cristiano Ronaldo mm. is a better goal scorer. Like, I, I think he would do anything 
to so like if you look at R nine's goals, mm. and you look at uh, Ronaldo CR 7s goals, the like Ronaldo just finds a way. R 9s goals were uh, very elegant. Like he beat three players, dink someone or whatever it may be. Whereas I think Cristiano just finds a way to score. So I think he would score more. Brazilian Ronaldo would also score a lot of poachers' goals as well. So he had a, a bit of everything. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's an, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, two of the greats. I mean, young people now will go, nah, there's Cristiano, it's Cristiano. But he was that good, wasn't he? Um, yeah, he was. El, fe El Phenomeno. So Gary, you know Ronaldo, don't you? Well, I know them both. I've, I've interviewed um, both Cristiano and um, El Phenomeno. And El um, actually many times um, with the Brazilian Ronaldo, um, did a documentary with him relatively recently, um, which was fab. And he's a lovely, lovely man. Let's, mm. let, let me tell you that f for starters. Um, just such an engaging personality, very warm, um, charismatic as well. And I also met him going back can you remember when they had the world club championship where manchester united went and didn't play in the fa cup because of mm -hmm. that there was a massive ferrari back home uh, about that but we covered that tournament um with the bbc it's actually a great gig we did about i think 10 days in january in rio de janeiro which was quite a nice little um, <laughs> escape. And I remember interviewing um, Brazilian Ronaldo there and he had the big, that was right in the middle of those injuries we talked about. And he had the biggest scar you've ever seen on, on his knee. Um, and and he, he was saying that he's, you know, it's really difficult trying to get back. He's been injured for so long. And um, so I knew him back then. Um, and he also, I also interviewed him about, um, about, I don't know, three, four years ago for in Ibiza because um, we made a film um, with him. And he was telling me about the... Because obviously in 1998, when they played in Paris, they had that huge thing where um, he was going to be in the team, then he wasn't in the team because he'd, he'd had some kind of seizure during the day in the hotel where he'd taken his siesta and then he woke up with medics all around him and... Um, and he was really, you know, he, in the end, they put the team in and he wasn't on it. And then mm. five minutes later, it was changed because he arrived in an ambulance, I think, for, <laughs> yeah. and wanted to play. Um, and then they ended up losing that final. And there were all sorts of, it was a kind of a big conspiracy theories about whether it was, it was done deliberately, whether it was a Nike thing, all lots of nonsense, obviously, <laughs> like most conspiracy theories. Um, and then I, I asked him the question for... I said, so four years later, you're playing in the World Cup final again. I said, did you take a siesta? And he went, no. He said, for the only game in my whole career, he says, I'm not, I daren't fall asleep. I was too scared of it happening again. Wow. And and he said, I, I, I stayed awake. He said, I walked around the hotel. I, I tried to find someone that was not having a siesta before the final he said and in the end he said i found the like the reserve goalkeeper and we just he said we just sat there talking about anything just to keep me awake uh, and then he goes and, and and scores two goals and they beat um beat germany in the final um so so what a man it's remarkable that was so remarkable on that um we'll have a break um not a three and a half year break but just <laughs> Got a question from PG. Who was the one player in the league during your eras that you thought stood out above the rest? Well, you're the most modern era, Mike, so you should remember best. <laughs> I'll have to say Thierry Henry. And we all know what he can do on the ball, but he just had some sort of confidence. You know, when you looked at him, it was almost like he was just oozing this self belief that it could do absolutely anything on the pitch. And I think we've talked about it before, but early days I played against him. And you know, he always likes to hover at the left part of the pitch, so the, the right back area on the opposition's team. And he megged me and just winked at me, you know, and I was just like, wow. 
Like football is so easy. Did you do that lip twitchy thing? That yeah, you, you know, know that, that little bit. <laughs> so so f- annoying that isn't it? <laughs> I I hate when he does that. It's like so immature. Grow up, will you? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would have to say Thierry Henry. Definitely. I think you're only saying that because he he might very well be a guest imminently Ooh. on our podcast. As, as are we well teasing know. it, Gary? Are we? It's just a little teaser of what's teaser. coming soon. Such an <laughs> like a really <Mike-er>. <laughs> <laughs> How did you think he got on the podcast, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Alan? Um, maybe Gaza and his pump. Um, <laughs> Uh, before his injuries and all of that, yeah, probably, probably Gaza. Uh, yeah, when I was coming towards the end, then Stephen Gerrard, I think Gerrard and scores also, but maybe maybe Gaza. Yeah, it was unbelievable in his pump. Yeah, I was thinking Gaza, but um, as you had him, I'll go. How about Glenn Hoddle? Um, I mean, Glenn was the most gorgeous footballer. Um, he he was graceful and his touch and his vision and his passing were as good as any player that. Uh, of his time and yeah. I used to feel for Glenn back then because we were kind of trapped into the world of four four two, where the two mid centre players in midfield were kind of wanted to go the other to chase back so you had to do in that the hard yards and that wasn't Glenn's game in the modern game you could you know he'd float around and he'd do his thing and honestly as as in terms of passing the football there's there's can't be anyone much better than than Glenn Hoddle um, I've got a question from Ian McTaggart. Uh, in the light of Rangers sacking Michael Beale, uh, what do you feel about managers being sacked so early in the season? Um, that was an early one, wasn't it, Michael Beale? Yeah, but you, you know, you know, Gary, that there's there's two there's two clubs that have to fight for the title up there, and without looking at the league, I think they're already seven points behind. Already lost three games. Um, uh, and th- that's not acceptable up in up in Scotland um, with Celtic or Rangers. So uh, it's not it was didn't come as a huge surprise to me. I said to you the day, didn't we? That yeah. the nearer you get to international breaks, or you get to an international break, there's going to be um, unfortunately there's going to be seconds. And I still say if if I know we've got one in a couple of weeks' time, so it wouldn't surprise me if um, if someone were to be sacked in the uh, in the Premier League also. Yeah, autumn is the sacking season. <laughs> it's, it's a tough occupation, uh, especially I suppose up there as well with you know the expectancy levels of of the fans of a club like Rangers will will be very high. Yeah, I, I it's a strange one for me because Michael Beale, where he was talked about as a as a great coach, and when he was at QPR, was he staying? Was he going? And then obviously was at um, Aston Villa with Steven Gerrard. And I thought, just by the way his teams played on the front foot, the way he spoke in interviews, I thought he would go up there and have a real good success. Um, He got in in a few squibbles with with Chris Sutton on on Twitter, and uh, he was talking about... Yeah, he was basically... He said something about Chris because Chris was... um, He's Celtic. Yeah, he's Celtic, and he's commentating on the games up, up in Scotland now. And he sort of, he got drawn into that when perhaps he, he should have just focused on the football side of him because like he put more pressure on himself than anything. And that every time he was in the press conference, there was picking out little words and the pressures getting to him and all that sort of thing. And I just think he picked the wrong battles. He should have just concentrated on the way he side wanted to play. Um, but in, in the end... That just weren't good enough. But I was surprised because I thought he would do a really good job up there. I wonder if he's the only man to manage both Rangers, Queen's Park Rangers and Rangers. Not that that's very interesting. I just <laughs> We've just been sat there thinking of that. <laughs> no, I just suddenly thought when we were talking about Q- Q- QPR. Um be interesting to see who they uh, get next. Right, um, from Joel Radcliffe. If you could swap places with any footballer and have their career, current or ex-player, 
Who would it be and why? Now, if it was off the pitch, I'd definitely go Micah Richards. <laughs> <laughs> but on the pitch, um, well, I, it, it would have to, be, have to be Messi now. He's won absolutely everything. Um, it would have to be him, I think. Um, God, that's How about cool. Sir Jeff Hurst, hat-trick, Ooh. World Cup final? Y- yeah, that's a good shout, although I'd, I'd, I'd be even older than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> Past or present, that was. I mean, it doesn't. No, it doesn't a good get shout. any. It doesn't get any bigger than the World Cup final hat trick winning, does it? Oh no, it doesn't. I wouldn't have thought so. So no, yeah, good, yep. Sir Jeff. I probably. Go I know what like, it is. I know what it is. Go on. What, what's, what am I going to say, Gary? Pablo Zabaleta. <laughs> 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 Don't be afraid. If you if you want to see me or Gary as well, feel free to see. <laughs> Cherry on me, Cherry on me. I'm working with him this week, so I'm going to say Terry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what I was going to say? I was going to say Aguero just for that moment, that iconic moment in Premier League history. To score a goal like that in the 93rd minute, 20 seconds. 93.20 and score that, I would say, for that moment. Aguero! Oh, it was fantastic, wasn't it? It was fantastic. It was, a, it was an incredible moment. There's no question about that. Um, here's one. I think it's um, directed at Alan. Um, let's make this the last one. Uh, Damien Fairclough. I would love to have seen Alan in the East Lanx derby. Was he aware of the importance of it while he was at Blackburn? And are there any games that you wish you could have played in but were unable to? We'll start us off with the East Lanks derby. Tell us about it, Alan. Yeah, I never, uh, I never had the pleasure of playing in, uh, in one, unfortunately. Um, Burnley, Blackburn, because um, they, um, they were always in the league below us, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was definitely aware of the rivalry because wherever you go, people um, very much like Newcastle, Sunderland or Spurs, Arsenal or... Celtic Rangers, Everton, Liverpool, you always get your bit of your bit of banter with uh, with the fans. But if there was one game I could have played in the derby, it would have to be that Celtic Rangers one. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Haven't been there as I haven't been there as a fan, it's an unbelievable atmosphere. And you can get away with a few things as well. I have been to an East Lanks derby, covered it for the I think it was an FA Cup. It was um yeah, it was um, quite nasty actually. Yeah. Yeah, they don't like each other. Yeah, I tell you, I tell you what, I'd love to go to, and I've I've, I've been to the ground, um, Boca Junior Juniors River Plate. Mm. The um, I've heard it's meant to be chaos. When is Aires Derby in Argentina? Yeah. It, I mean, I've been there when I, I when I was filming with Diego, and um, it was. Well, you've dropped some names on this one, haven't you? By the way, I've, you know, I've, I've been around a long time, Alan. <laughs> At the Bombonera, Diego the Bombonera Ronaldo. Stadium. Like, Honestly, when we went that day with Diego, he was um, we were filming him for three days doing a documentary um, with him, and he was he was brilliant. But his life was it, it was just incredible. It was madness everywhere. Um, hundreds of people. It was. Have you seen um, Life of Brian? The sketch where they're all following the Messiah, or no, everyone <laughs> follows him everywhere. I, <laughs> I, this is the real Messiah. I should know. I followed a few and all that kind of stuff. A comedy, obviously, but his life was sort of like that. People everywhere they went, it was like he was treated in like a god. And, yeah, and he was. I mean, he was quite nuts anyway. Diego, a lot of fun. And we went to watch the game at the Bombonera. It wasn't the derby against River Plate, but it was. It was obviously Boca Juniors, and the atmosphere was incredible, incredible. They were jumping up and down and singing and stuff. And he was joining in from his, he's got a little um, box there where he watched the game. And he was leaning so far over the balcony that his daughter was holding onto him so he wouldn't fall off. Um, and yeah, he was, I mean, he was, he was mad. So I would, I would say probably that one. Micah? Sorry, I was, I was so in, 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 ch- in tune with your, no, with your was, story. It was no, we were just the talking question. about... Um, Derbies. Which, which derby would you like to play in if you didn't play in one? Um, ooh, yeah, I'd probably go Celtic Rangers. You too. Yeah. That, that, that's the one that looks the most ferocious. Here's, here's a question for you both. If, if you were at the Celtic Rangers derby, which 
team would you want to be playing oh, for? <laughs> what are you trying to get? You know what you're trying to get? Abuse one. You just ask him. I go to Scotland quite often, and I want to keep it that way. <laughs> There's no chance I'm picking up. <laughs> That's one question too far for you both, so let's call it a day. Um, g- goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Cheers. And we might be back soon with that special guest where we'll see Micah Richards crawling over Thierry Henry. Mm-hmm.